Hello there and welcome to the channel. This is Nerd World History. And today carrying on with my exploration of the different Celtic peoples of ancient Britannia before the Roman invasion. And in this episode we're dealing with an individual, a queen, who you may or may not have heard of. I'm assuming you may have done as you've clicked on this video. But she was called Cartamandua. I think that's how it's pronounced. And she was queen of the Brigantes and an ally of the Romans. Now... Before we get into her story, which is a pretty interesting one, I'll be honest. Please like, share, subscribe and comment down below if you like this video and what you do or don't know about Cartamandua and the Brigantes tribe. And also, link down below are my other two channels, Nerd World Films and Nerd World, that have nothing like this channel whatsoever. One's about films, one's about all things nerdy, hence the title generally my channel's Nerd World. Check them out. If you like them, please subscribe over there as well. You'll also find links to various different social medias that I'm on, that I do occasionally at least check. And with that said, this video is brought to you in collaboration with The Beard Struggle, but we will get to them later. For now, let's get into this video. I think that's a long enough intro, I think. Now, although most people will know the story of Boudicca, the one story that will leave people scratching their heads and saying, who, is probably that of Cartamandua, another Celtic queen from the first century AD, dating from the same time as Boudicca, and made a lot of the same decisions to join with the Romans and ally with them. Like her, she was of a tribe that became a client kingdom to the Romans, although a little further north than the Iceni. Though arguably, Cartamandua was a far more successful queen than Boudicca and thrived under the Romans. Her and her husband Venetus chose their sides well and showed their loyalty to the Empire, which was, you know, a little treacherous, really. Now, this woman is no hero from our history, which is probably why I think she's not looked on as favourably. She ruled over the Brigantes tribe, who I've done a video on previously, who were the largest tribe in Celtic Britain, from 43 AD to 69 AD. It's not clear if she was the ruler of the tribe before the Romans turned up, or she became ruler after, or during the conquest at some point. She was clearly and definitely from one of the ruling houses, so the nobility of the Celtic kingdom of the Brigantes, as she was already a recognised leader, at least. Now, with their position as a client kingdom, the Brigantes benefited from all the upsides of the Roman Empire without a lot of the negatives. This was a fairly common Roman practice. They would create a buffer state between them and unconquered territories further beyond. In this instance, in Britannia, they used the Brigantes to defend them against more hostile tribes, such as the Votadini and, the, and other such tribes from further north, who could potentially still pose a threat and could unite with the southern tr with tribes further south and continue to resist the Romans. But that said, with the Brigantes, they also provided warriors to help in the subjugation of other tribes across England. So there were benefits on the Roman side as well. Now, all things were all well and good for the Brigantes in these early days. Trade was good. Negotiations with the Romans were good. Their relations with the Roman generals and governor were all good. But then Cartamandua decided that she was going to divorce her husband and basically marry one of his men-at-arms, Velakaitis. This alienated many of the other local Celts and turned others more against her. It villainized her in the eyes of many of her own people. Venetus went into exile and began to play on anti-Roman sentiment, even though he himself had been a pro-Roman supporter and ally of the Romans, hypocrite, and he used this to stage a rebellion and attempt to invade Brigantia, the territory of the Brigantes, and take power for himself back. But the Roman, general, Roman governor sent an army north to assist in the defence of the Brigantes against the rebels and their allies. They were successful, but Venetus was not outright defeated or captured or killed. He again went into exile and would bide his time. This happened in approximately 57 AD. Now, again, things carry on, fairly nice and normal for a number of years until about 69 AD, when 
he comes back with a vengeance. Now around this time is when Emperor Nero has died and the Empire has gone into something of a bit of turmoil. He tries to take advantage of this to push the Romans out to Brigante's territory and basically become the next Caraticus. He is limitedly successful as he manages to dethrone his ex-wife and her new husband and take control of the Brigantes for himself. Once again, he rules them for just a few years though because eventually the Romans get their act together and they send in the army once again to oust him off the throne. However, we don't know, as it's not been recorded, exactly what happened to Carta Mandua. Now, we know she was dethroned and she fled south to a Roman fort and that's it. We don't know if she was put back in charge, her and her new husband, back over the Brigantes, but the Brigantes at that point became fully integrated as a kingdom state of the Roman Empire. In other words, they were conquered. The Romans may have simply decided it was time to move further north and they no longer needed that buffer state because, you know, Romans got to do what Romans do. Now, taking a little shuffle back to 51 AD when she was still married to Venetus and this is why Venetus is a hypocrite for wanting to become the next Caraticus. So we'll touch on this just slightly as it's connected to the wider story. Cartamandua, Queen of the Brigantes, Caraticus, leader of the rebellion against the Romans. He is defeated resoundingly in North Wales. He fleds north once again, just like he'd done once the Catavalloni tribe were defeated after he fled to Wales. Now he flees north to garner more support, thinking because the Brigantes are a fellow Celtic kingdom and him being the high chieftain and all, they might show him a little favour. They don't. As soon as he arrives in Brigantes' territory, thinking he's going to be welcomed with open arms and maybe get a little support. He is clamped in irons, literally, and handed back to the Romans by Cartamandua herself, who is richly rewarded. Again, client kingdom status benefiting the Romans there. Now, it should be noted that, again, Britain was divided into various different political entities or ancient tribal kingdoms before the Romans turned up. Now, these, although were united by language, culture and religion, were not by any means united. And although it could, on occasion, come together to work for common goals, like they'd done 100 years earlier to defeat Julius Caesar, that doesn't mean that that's what they're going to do every time. This is like saying that, well, the Germans and the French live right next to each other. Why did, why did we all go to war twice in the 20th century? Just because you live next to someone and you've done it for a long time doesn't mean you're naturally going to be allies. It was exactly the same thing. Some tribes fought the Romans, like the Catavalloni. Other tribes worked with them, like the Iceni and the Trinovantes and the Brigantes. Now, of course, the Brigantes worked with them and they handed him straight over. And this is where she first shows her true colours, in my opinion, as it's more than just survival now. She's actively working against any efforts to throw out an invading military army. This is where I think she isn't as well remembered, or at least not as fondly remembered, as Boudicca. Now, Boudicca died a heroic death defending her people against the Romans and fighting to avenge her scorned honour. But again, something can be said for the fact that she initially, and her husband, both were right there in bed with the Romans when they turned up. You could say that it was her husband that made that decision and not her, but Celtic society men and women were much more even than they were in Roman society. Which also may explain what happened to Cartamandua. They may have simply not thought it worthwhile to put a woman back in charge, because clearly she was the one wearing the pants in the relationship in the Celtic kingdom of the Brigantes. Now, just before we go any further into the story of Cartamandua and the Brigantes and her alliance with the Romans, let's talk about another ancient civilization, the Vikings, and how you can become more like one. <laughs> the Beard Struggle. They are working collaboration with me to give me a code that I can give to you. It is linked in the description below that if you click on it and go to their website, sign up, you will get a 15% discount off your first purchase. They sell various merchandises for the generous and glorious maintenance of your beard. If the health of your beard is of any concern to you or you have any problems growing it, that is a sight to see. They have various tutorials on how to use their products, how to deal with if you've got a patchy beard, how to make it, make it more luscious and vibrant, and how to generally make it smell gorgeous with a quite a nice variety of beard oils and other scents that you can put into it. They, as I say, are linked in the description below. 
check them out. And again, if you want anything via that, go via that link and you'll get a 15% discount on your first purchase. That helps out the channel. And if you're anything like me, it will help out you with your glorious beard. Now let's get back to the video. Now all of this is just begging you to ask the question, why? Why would you choose to work with an invading army from a foreign power, from a distant land that you don't really know? You don't know their motives, but what you do know is you know that they're fighting against your kin, they're trying to destroy your way of life, they hate your religion, the druids are being massacred, and you already saw what they did in Gaul. You know about that from a hundred years earlier. The slaughter, the slavery, the conquest, and the destruction of Celtic culture on a fundamental level while it was absorbed into that of the Romans. Now, why would you do it? Now, it's a complicated question, and the answer is equally complicated. So, in brief, money. The Romans have a lot of it. She wanted more. You can see this in some ways from, some, from the more affluent kingdoms, like the Brigantes, who worked with the Romans. They benefited from all the benefits of the empire. They got lovely villas built for them, nice roads. Their people weren't massively enslaved. Now, at her, what is considered to be the Brigantes' capital, or at least possibly the capital during Cartamandua's time, was a settlement called Stanwyck. And all the, the settlements in the local area show a similar level of affluence. In Stanwyck, it had very impressive five meter high stone walls that, around the settlement, which, although were no match for a, a Roman war machine, were very impressive by Iron Age standards in Britannia. It was already a wealthy settlement before the Romans turned up, but from it, large amounts of Roman silver, Roman coin, Roman amphora, and other materials ex imported from right across the entire width and breadth of the Roman Empire have been found there and in local settlements to it. And to a degree, there is your answer. But also, you've got the Roman seduction. The Romans spent a hundred years after Julius Caesar's foyer into Britannia. They realized that the locals were just as hostile and just as vicious as their Gaulish counterparts on the continent. The difference was to get here, you needed to come by ship. You needed to secure supply lines. It was a much more risky endeavor. Oceans were not the natural place for Romans. Also, the weather up north is very different to that in the Mediterranean, and Roman ships weren't built for it. Many of Julius Caesar's ships were wrecked in storms, for example, before he even got here. But once they were here, the, the land, the people were incredibly hostile, xenophobic, and territorial, and used to war. And they spent then a hundred years after that seducing them, educating their children in Rome. A bit like what happened with the Atrobartes. They teach them how to be Roman, they make them want to be Roman, and then they send them home to a little muddy roundhouse, and it's like, no, I want my villa back. So you can start to see why they might choose to ally with Romans. It could also be self-preservation. There's always going to be people who are greedy enough, selfish enough, entitled enough, or whatever, are simply not believers. They there may not have been a religious component to it. She might not have cared that the Druids are being wiped out. I'll adopt Roman gods. It makes no difference to me. Maybe she was atheist. Doesn't matter, really. It's, hard. it's impossible to say. Now, the Romans, yes, they were destroying their way of life. But you're always going to have, in any civilization, people who will collaborate with the enemy for money, power, self-preservation, or generally ideological beliefs being in line with those that are invading. You see this during the Soviet era the communist bloc, there were always people willing to collaborate, always willing for the enticement of power and money that they will work with the invading army. It happened in Poland, it happened in Lithuania, it happened in Romania, you always have it. It's still going on in the world right now, we just don't think of it as something that perhaps people would have been thinking about back then, but they certainly were, because people have always been people. So there in brief, is probably an overview of why you might want to join the Roman Empire rather than oppose it. Something could be said that if everyone had listened to Caraticus, if every tribe had resisted them, as a united front, the Romans probably wouldn't have been able to win. Or at least it would have been so difficult to win, it would have been what they literally would have called a Pyrrhic victory. 
and they would have lost so many lives, spent so much money and expended so much resources in the conquest that it simply wasn't worth it. Which is believed to be possibly one of the reasons why they never actually invaded Hibernia and why they gave up on Scotland. Ireland and Scotland, basically. So without going too much more into hypotheticals and what-ifs and the whys, that is Carta Mandua. The forgotten tribal queen of the Brigantes from the mid first century AD, and actually one of the most successful queens in Iron Age Celtic history in Britain. She was an incredibly successful ruler. She managed to retain her kingdom's independence. She managed to retain wealth and power for her people and prevent them being enslaved. The Brigantes, although, were certainly subjugated by the Romans and eventually would have their culture effectively annihilated by that of the Romans. They did thrive, and although you could see it as cowardly, maybe her reasons were selfish, we'll really never know. They probably were completely self-motivated. It, it doesn't look to me, as an outsider looking in at what, she, what the decisions were made by her and her husbands to join with the Romans, the fact that their armies were willing to be loyal, it tells me that the decision was not motivated by some sense of cultural self-preservation or like we're go we're, they're going to they're going to steamroll over us no matter what we do it was they're powerful i want to be on their side our enemies to the south and to the north these people are helped us defend against them when celtic kingdoms from the north would attack the brigantes the roman army was there to back them up and all the romans effectively asked for in return was a bit of loyalty some taxes and unlike tribes like the iceni they weren't banned from carrying weapons they weren't forcibly having their religion stomped out. It was in an inter a more generous integration. But it should never be thought of as anything less than a conquest. Tacitus once put it, at least I believe it was Tacitus, he was writing around this time period and actually did write about Cartamandua. She's actually mentioned in his writings. But he, and I'm paraphrasing here because I'll admit I can't quite remember the exact quote, but basically, he talks about how the Britons adopt Roman culture. They begin to speak Latin. They wear togas. They drink wine from emperors. And they consider this civilization, when in reality, it is nothing more than the metaphorical shackles of their enslavement. And they just don't realize it. It's like bribing a conquered kingdom by building a few McDonald's and saying, welcome to the first world. Is effectively what he was saying. And that's what she bought into. She bought into that dream, that idea of Rome. So, there we are. Cartamandua, Queen of the Brigantes, and, in my humble opinion, traitor to her own people. She basically handed them over to a conquering army. She opened up the floodgates to the north and prevented leaders like Caraticus from gaining reinforcements, both from her own people and from other tribes further north that would have worked which would likely have worked with him to try and beat the Romans again doesn't mean he would have won but it wasn't exactly a asset was it so that brings us to the end of her story if you made it all the way to the video thank you for watching and bye bye